Welcome to What Drives You with your host, Mike Gorday. Human Solution Consultant from Seattle, Washington. It is now time to sit back, buckle up for the show that drives the asking question of what drives you. And now your host, Mike Gorday. Hello and welcome to this, our inaugural show of What Drives You, the show about why we do the things we do. I'm your host, Mike Gorday, and I am a human solutions consultant here in the Seattle, Washington area. And before we jump into our main points, let's talk a little bit about who I am real quick and why this radio show. For the past well, for over 20 years, I've worked in the helping fields. I've worked in the fields of addiction and disability for many of those years. I've also uh, been a coach for many years, working with uh, teenagers all the way up to corporate executive types. I have a master's degree in forensic psychology, which should give you a little bit of an indication of some of the interest areas that I have, uh, as well as many other studies in other, other human behavior realms. Uh, the, this radio show is mostly based on the idea that uh, uh, now, of course, I, I think human behavior is a very fascinating field. And if you're listening to this, probably you have some interest in it as well. Uh, one of the main points about this is when we study human behavior, we start to unravel the reasons why people do things what they do. And it helps us to understand better about what is going on. Meaning, you know, we have, we have a typical way of dealing with things, and that's by making a snap job judgment, which creates uh, a quick relief, but it, it tends to generate problems. And I'm going to talk a lot about this kind of stuff in the coming, coming shows. But uh, the, the point is, is that when we, delve into the reasons why people are doing the things that they're doing, we can distance ourselves a little bit and, and we can understand and connect better with, with other people when we don't make those snap judgments, when we don't let the normal way our brain works intercede into asking ourselves, why are they doing that? And that's really the purpose of this show. Uh, I, I hope it's going to be entertaining and educational. And, you know, there's always always some level of interest in why why people choose the fields of occupation that they do or what, what drives people to that rags to riches story. Why, why, somebody, why somebody who was underprivileged as a youth is suddenly now successful as a business person or you know, why people go from running the streets to running a church, anything like that. The, 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 these type of things are all fascinating to me. And I hope they are to you as well. And that kind of goes into the, to today's elephant in the room, and that's COVID. And I don't know if everybody here experiences the same sort of thing that I do, but when I talk to people nowadays, that it COVID has become the weather question or the weather COVID has become the new weather small talk. You know, how are you doing? How are you coping? What's going on? Oh my gosh. You know, everybody that I talk to, we have to go through this COVID conversation somehow relating. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that because we're all dealing with that. And what I, what I specifically want to talk about today is why, why, why all the weird stuff? We look at all the things going on during this unprecedented time. We look at the, I mean, look at the riots, the violence, the, the political storms, the, the, the weird shortages on things like toilet paper and flour. Uh, and, and, for many of us, it doesn't make any sense. It, it makes no sense to us. Why, why are people doing this? We all think that uh, this gives us an excuse to go out and run rampant around the streets. That's not exactly what's going on. 
one of the perspectives here that I like to discuss with you is uncertainty. One of the biggest fears that we as human beings have is the fear of the unknown. And regardless of what the science says, what COVID is, it has created a level of unknown in our lives that is that has reached fearful, epic proportions. And that is simply the nature of what it is to be human. When we don't know, when we can't count on something, it frightens us. And that's, that's on the surface, that's a very natural response, right? I mean, if you, if you look at it, it, the way our brains are wired is for survival. And our brains are predicting machines. They're always looking for threats. And if we can't predict something, that means we, we're automatically placing it in a category of threat. And COVID has done this to us really well, not just locally, but globally. We're seeing a lot of the same things going on in other countries across the world. The level of uncertainty has created a lot of fear, and we try to medicate that fear. We try to overcome that fear by doing things that give us some level of certainty. So how can, if in, in this COVID pandemic social situation, if I've lost my job because of this, because of all the shutdowns and all the shelterings and, and whatnot, how do I alleviate some of that fear? Well, I can go out and I can protest against uh, the police or I can protest against Black Lives Matter or I can protest against why the sky is blue. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. All it means is that I'm doing something that I can control. And when I can do something that I can control, I can have some certainty and that can alleviate the fear of what all this stuff means. And no one out there really knows what this means. We, we don't have information about this disease enough to really anticipate what's going to happen. Uh, we don't have, and if we do, we don't have any corresponding media that is giving us information that looks or acts like the other media outlets giving us that same information. So we don't know which way is up. And when we don't know which way is up, we start making our way up. Uh, and it's all based on that survival part of our brain. If you look at, if you look at the way the brain works, uh, it's, a, it's a very, there are very simple processes that drive our behavior. And one of those processes is the pleasure pain, pain principle. You may have heard that, you may have not, but I call it the binary brain. It's basically the basic, the most basic program of making decisions that, that a living being has. If it's going to cause us pain, we're going to move away from it. If it's going to cause us pleasure, we're going to move towards it. Then that is generally driven by the emotion of fear or excitement. If you think about that, fear is associated with pain, excitement with pleasure, and that is that prediction. Uh, there's a lot of fear going on right now. And I think the best definition of fear that I've, I've heard would be, or I believe I read it in one of Tony Robbins' books back in the 90s or the late 80s. I can't remember when. But it's one of the simplest, best definitions of fear. It's anticipation of pain. Uh, like I said, our brains are predicting machines. We're always out there looking for threats. And when we find something that we feel like is a, a threat to us, we generate what's called fear. Or it's an emotive force that wants us to move away from that. You will often hear it as the flight or fight sim, uh, system. Um, and again, this is these are very complex systems that I'm trying to describe in simple terms. But uh, when we when we do something that generates fear, 
we often have the energy to do something, whether it's move away from it, move towards it, uh, faint, whatever. The end result is that we're trying, we're going to try to do something to alleviate the fear. And one of the things I'd like to add on to that anticipation of pain is what fear is, is, is the fact that the brain has no idea what's real and what's not real. It relies on your consciousness to tell it. And even then it still is, a, is uncertain. So when we anticipate pain, and we create that fear, we're also creating pain, which our brain wants us to move away from. So it's, so it, it, you can see how easily it, it can to get very complicated. We have a very simple way of making a decision, but we add, there's levels of complexity to it. So many times, Many times it's it's very easy to try to alleviate that fear through other emotional responses like anger, um, which is the basis of a lot of the protests and violence that we're seeing out there. And while I'm not justifying this, I'm just trying to encourage you to understand the natural way this progresses because here's what happened. We require a sense of security, a sense of certainty. That is a, that is one of our most basic needs. Our biggest, one of our biggest fears as human beings is the fear of the unknown. Pre COVID everything went along as normal. And when I say normal, I mean, I was going to get up tomorrow morning. I was going to get up. I was going to do my daily routine. I was going to jump in my car. I was going to drive my crappy commute to my office. I was going to sit in my office all day doing work. And then at some point, have, and then you see how I'm anticipating that? That's my routine. And as long as that routine is going to be there, as miserable as I may be, I'm happy. I know that sounds funny. But as long as I know that routine is going to be there, I'm comfortable and I'm certain. And when I feel certain, my brain is happy. And here comes, here comes this virus. Here comes this global pandemic. Nobody knows what it's, what it's going to do. Nobody knows how it's going to act. Nobody knows how it's going to affect the population. All we know is that it's spreading really fast and a lot of people are suddenly dying. What do we do? Oh, well, where do you think this generates? What, or what do you think this generates? It starts generating a lot of fear. It starts generating, generating fear in the people who are trying to manage the responses. It's generating fear in the people that don't even know that it exists yet. It's trying to manage, or it's, it's fear in the people that are running the government. It's all this stuff comes out, and what do we do? Well, we shut down everything. We just stop. Okay, this is the global, global response, fight or flight system of freeze or faint. We just freeze. We're going to freeze. We're not going to do it. Everybody stay home. Nobody go out. That's what we're going to do to handle this. But that's only a temporary solution. What happens then? Well, everybody knows what happens. Some people are going to do that and some people are not going to do that. We're starting to see these complex behaviors come out in people, but they're all responses to this uncertainty. We don't know what to do, so we're going to do what we think we should do. And that could mean I'm going to go home and stay at home and work from home and not talk to anybody, not get within six feet of anybody, or I'm going to be defiant and I'm going to go and do life as normal because screw you, you can't tell me what to do, virus or governor or president or mom, right? These are all responses. These are all 
attempts to alleviate the uncertainty of the of the current situation. It's easier for us to resort to short term fixes, which can often lead to not so good consequences. It's easy for us to make destructive decisions over constructive decisions. And that's that should be an easy process to understand. It's harder to build things than to destroy things. It's easier to have an angry response where we're out running around yelling at everybody for not wearing masks or wearing masks or being sheeple or whatever it is you're running around yelling at than to sit back and and this is a therapeutic term, sit with that feeling of fear and try to understand what's going on. Not a happy thought, but that's, that's sort of the root of what, what we're doing here. That's sort of the root of what's going on. This COVID situation has presented us with a lot of uncertainty, but it's also given us a lot of opportunity the problem is, is that we often resort to the short-term measures. We often resort to the quickest point between where we want to be and where we are, and that's usually uh, not extremely productive. Not to say that I'm, I'm trying not to say here that ha this has anything to do with whether the protests or the whether the protest or the political things have any business being anywhere, because this is not about that. It's just about the emotional responses that drive this. It's almost, I could almost say that if COVID hadn't happened, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing now would be on a smaller scale or would not have happened at all because we were really entrenched in our routine lifestyles. And we always are until change comes on. But that's really one of the only constants in the universe is change. We can't keep things the same. Unfortunately, our brains want to. Our brain wants to keep things the same. So here we are. We've been in, what are we in, eight, month eight maybe, of COVID life. And... I don't know about you, but I know a lot of the people I know are trying to be back. To, they're trying to go back to normal and they can't. And it's frustrating. And it's frustrating for me. It's fru I'm sure it's frustrating for everybody. And we're trying to make sense of all this stuff. Well, that's here's why I think this is important. Understanding that and being not only understanding that, but being able to step away from something and to look at a, at a situation and try to understand what's going on in that person is paramount to one of the greater processes that humans have over every other living being on the planet. We can choose a different alternative. If somebody is yelling at me because I'm, if, if somebody is demanding that I wear a mask or let's, let's, let's say that I'm a, I'm a grocery store employee and I'm trying to tell people that's coming in to wear a mask and that, and we've seen all we, I think we probably have all seen these YouTube videos where people are running into grocery stores without their mask just so they can get into some sort of conflict with management. And whether you're for or against it, it doesn't matter. What I'm talking about is the emotional response we get from watching those videos or the emotional response we get from being a part of that system. When we can take a step back and we can look at what both sides are doing, we can try to understand why they're doing it, and we can look at what's driving that behavior. We can step back and then we can we can – we can alleviate our own discomfort by understanding what's going on. That's, that's the certainty that we want. That's the certainty that is productive rather than just letting my emotions go and letting me become part of the problem. 
Does that make sense? And to many people, it may not. Because after all, it is a, a very simple thing to see in a case by case situation, but it's very complex to try and sort this out in the moment. But knowledge helps us, understanding helps us. And it's interesting to note here that uh, my drive to learn is predicated on the same exact model. Whether it's human behavior or quantum physics or, or neuroscience or whatever it is that I really want to learn about. I want to learn as much as I can about it because then I can have some level of certainty about it. I can then start looking for things that may be different and may, may be threatening, or I can look at things that may be more pleasurable and guarantee you, if you learn more about human behavior, you can start choosing these alternatives rather than reacting to the situation as as our perceptions perceive it to be. So that is about the elephant in the room for this first show. I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to be back with our guest for the afternoon. And then we will finish off today with a question. What, what do you wanna know about human behavior? Thank you very much. Come back. After the break, I'm Mike Gordy. Okay, welcome back to What Drives You? This segment we're going to be talking with Nathan Mum, a local technology wizard. You like is to that call correct? me a technology wizard? I just I would call myself just a technology uh, hack. But if you want to call me a wizard, that sounds much better. All right. Well, uh, whatever you like to call yourself, Nathan. Uh, he is a technology expert. He's worked for Microsoft for many years and is a consultant in the Seattle area. He also has his own podcast, which I am a part of, called Tech Time Radio. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very Nathan. much. Yeah, yeah, yes, you're the best part of the show. That's what I hear from all, from everybody <laughs> else. So now you're branching out on your own, and that's going to be great. And we're really excited about that. We'll have to make sure that uh, uh, you don't get too popular, though. Otherwise, I have to find another co-host. Right? Yes. All right. right. Okay. So uh, as we've talked about, my, my show is basically about human behavior and how that plays out in in the what what people do and how people do it. Um, so one of the interests that I have is finding out what drives other people. So you you know we've we've talked a little bit about your uh, fascination with technology and and you're in the technology. How long have you been in the technology field? So I uh, go on thirty years. So back in the early 80s, I used to work in a church program and a fellow there would moonlight on Thursday night building computers on the side. So I built my first 808, 286 uh, machines for him on Thursday nights from five until about 11 o'clock at night when I was 15, 16, and 17. And then I uh, uh, went to college for a little bit and then got in trouble at college, got got kicked out, which ended up then getting me an interview at a company called Microsoft. And so I started working in Microsoft in 1993. Okay. So it's, it's probably a, a good thing to say that you are pretty passionate about technology. Is that correct? So I like it. Yes. I, I like learning. I like learning new uh, aspects and technology was the forefront of uh uh, exploration besides a, a car or a vehicle that you could work on for my age. So I absolutely jumped to it and, and enjoyed it. Okay. So the, the title of the segment as well as the radio is what drives you? And that's, that's kind of the question I want to pose to you is what drives you in this technology fueled interest? 
So really, so if you go back to the, the hardcore area of what drives me, it probably stems from a, a teacher in a small private school that I was a part of back in uh, eighth, ninth grade time frame when I had a teacher that, um, and it's amazing to think of this at the time, um, said <laughs> that I probably would amount to nothing. And that I, oh. that I didn't have the drive, I didn't have the energy, and I was pretty much wasting time at this school that my parents were paying some pretty good money for to, to have me in this private school for this higher education area. And essentially, I ended up leaving that school and, and, and going to a public school. But um, ever since that time that that teacher said that I would not really amount to anything, I, I essentially mm -hmm. pushed the... Uh, cart much quicker down the hill than possible of saying, yes, I was going to try to be successful in everything I do. So do you think that that single event is the trigger point for this sort of, you have, cause you're very competitive. We've talked about your competitive nature a lot. I am very competitive. I'm competitive in everything I do, whether that's cooking dinner, whether that's having uh, a cornhole uh, in the backyard for playing during the summertime, everything I do is very competitive. And right, we, I, I do fantasy football leagues. I, I used to own a minor league basketball team as a part of my retirement from Microsoft. And so all of those have been considered large um, competitive areas that, I, that I've been a part of. Yeah, we, we talked about a funny story about uh, you learning how to cook. Uh, is it okay we share that story? Yeah, absolutely. Story? Yeah. Uh, so your your wife, in a discussion about your competitive nature, uh, tells me that uh, you are learning how to cook because she cooks better than you, and yep. you're learning so that you can learn how to cook better than her. That 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 is correct. So again, I I don't know what happened to me. I think I must have been damaged um, from that poor teacher <laughs> that said that I would never amount to anything. So so I drive a hard. A uh, hard process of everything that I do. So whether that's downtime, uptime, I don't sleep necessarily a lot of hours. Um, mm -hmm. So I sleep with my eyes open, which is a little bit weird too. And most of the time I'm sleeping, I'm thinking about other business ideas, other areas that I can be uh, learning. So really, I think that spawns me on to learn different things. So I like to cook. I'm really spending a lot of time in some cooking areas. I'd love to own a couple little uh, pull-up restaurants um, that would be available, you know, the food cart type areas where mm -hmm. you're just pulling a truck. Um, so I really have a lot of interest in, in, I don't know, my wife always says, well, am I able to focus on current items? And, and so technology is my focus and I'm able to, mm -hmm. to currently spend my time on that. I just don't have a lot of downtime that I relax. So my relaxing time is figuring out new business ventures or new ideas. I do property management for some, some large organizations and, and investors that we have working on a lot of different properties. So mm -hmm. it's just trying to learn a new skill set, a new skill set, a new skill set. Okay. And, and would you say that you weren't very competitive until this teacher basically yeah, you know you. what? Probably I wasn't. No, because if I look back in like eighth or ninth grade, I was just kind of ho hum. Um, didn't really compete in too many sports. It was not too bad. And then all of a sudden, this person says that, and then I got very competitive in athletics. Uh, and I was a little bit of a smaller tyke growing up. I'm only like five eleven now, so I wasn't mm -hmm. able to participate. But I I, I played basketball um for um a lot of competitive sports that we had available for our age back then in freshman sophomore year uh in high school i played um oh baseball pretty competitively also so that trigger kind of got me into both sports and then I, I wanted to succeed in business and so i really think it was but a lot of it also has to come to, I'm a, I, I think I have a betting problem because I, I like to bet people, whether it's large amounts of money, which is never is, but small amounts of money, I essentially getting in trouble at the local college was really over like a dollar bet with a friend. So I mean, really? it was no real money, but it was like, he didn't believe that I could do X amount of things. And I said, well, I can absolutely shut down all the computers at 
Everett Community College. He's like, no, you don't, mom. You don't know what you're oh, talking no. about. And, and so for a dollar bet, yeah, I, 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 I had a nice uh, uh, $20,000 bill and in, in, in got in trouble <laughs> with the, the community college for shutting down a bunch of uh, computers in the library through uh, the BIOS of the hard drive itself. I put passwords on them and, and then um, had it so that they wouldn't boot up. Back in the olden days with computers booting up, you had to have sectors and, and yeah. logical blocks addressed for each of the hard drives. And yeah, so I think it's really a competitive bet. If you say, hey, I'll bet you five bucks or I'll bet you a buck on something and, I, and I'm competitive, that's probably my worst juice. It's kind of like Marty McFly getting told that he's chicken, you know, in he's the movies. Chicken. And he just starts punching everybody and, and, and getting, yeah. So mine is, hey, do you want to make a, a bet? And that, that just, that's, that's, that's the secret. Yeah, I thought, I thought about uh, the movie Trading Places when you said a dollar bet. Yeah, yeah, no, that's the same, yeah. <laughs> So, so I, so I get in trouble on, on, on a little bit of bets. So, yes. Okay. So it, what is, what do you think it is about this one particular teacher telling you this? I mean, a lot of times you see uh, a consistent message that, that creates this sort of drive. Why, why this single one teacher? Do you, have you ever asked yourself that question? You know what? I think, I, yeah, I kind of have. And so this one teacher was the teacher that I actually looked up to. So that was the, okay. that was probably what drove me is that I thought this teacher was one of the first teachers that I had that was pretty fair. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of let everybody do the job that needed to be taken care of. It was in uh, history, as a matter of fact, and I, and I liked history, even though my grades don't reflect that I liked history in high school. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I liked that subject. And, and so when we're learning about history and all this, I was really excited to be there. And then to get called out on this, it was just, it was just so impactful. I didn't even tell my parents at the, at the time. I think I've told them now. Uh, 10, 15 years ago that, that this happened, but it just really kind of motivated me saying, you know what, screw that. If, if somebody really thinks this, then I'm going to have to do something completely opposite, change what I'm doing so that I can be more competitive and make sure that that doesn't happen. Okay. Was this a public claimant or a private? So uh, no, they, this person actually said it during class. Okay. So it, it was in front of your your peers. Yep. It was in front of all my peers at the same time. Okay. Well, and how do you, how do you, are you, are you glad that that happened in retrospect? Uh, so I've or? seen this individual many times after. Um, so this person um, works as an administrator to the school at that time he was a teacher. So I've seen this person many times and, and I really hold no grudges to the person. I talk to him. I don't think the person even remembers the comment that they made. Probably not because we've talked many times after that. And if that, that was the case, I think, um, he would approach me differently and we wouldn't talk about different items. Um, so yeah, I, I just think it was a time as a, as a young freshman and in, in high school, pretty formidable time. And, and mm -hmm. having somebody challenge me to, to that, I think just kicked in the, uh, the juices to say, I need to be really competitive. Essentially, I, I want to create a legacy is, is my whole goal of what drives me. I want the mom name, her last name to be uh, very predominant in the community after I pass. And so right. I would like to create a legacy for my kids to enjoy and other people to enjoy, not necessarily financially even, but just a legacy of history and, and commitment and, and, and the ability to be successful in the community itself. Well, perfect. All right. Well, that's a, that's an interesting story. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Well, thank you. So that, that'll, that'll be it for today. Thanks for joining me here on uh, what drives you. Not um, a problem, Mike. I hope to uh, have you contribute more. As so what happens when on? I want to interview you and find out what drives you? Well, probably not making me bet a dollar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. But you know, we, yeah, we've already, you know, you, you're, you're always calling me the lie to me guy. Yeah. 
I find kind of funny, but um, you know, all you have to do is ask. That's that's uh, that's right. Okay, I'll, I'll we'll have to dedicate one show on our podcast where we just I'll I'll do a flip reverse show. You can do the the tech time show, and, and I'll be the co-host, and then I'll do a lie to me uh, expert analysis, and then I'll do what drives me. So we can do a uh, what do they call those on CBS, like back to back episodes of the same TV program going and, and, and being the same uh, crossovers. Yeah, the crossover. We'll have to do a crossover. There you go. Yeah, that sounds like fun. All right. Well, thanks for joining me today and have a great day. I, I noticed you have that nice view out your window there. You know what? It is only summertime here in the Seattle area, 16 days out of the year. So we better use all 16 of them up very quickly. Yes, I know. I, I am really not looking forward to the misty creations that are coming down the pike. Welcome to fall and, and winter. Yeah, I know it. I still haven't gotten used to the the getting dark at 430 thing. Yeah, that, that's tough too. All right. Well, again, thanks for thanks for hanging with me today. And I look forward to seeing you back on our set in a uh, Next week, I think, right? Yep, that sounds good. Yep, thanks, Mike. All right, take care, have a great time, and whatever else that drives you. All right, thank you. And welcome back for our final segment of the day. That's where I answer one of your questions. Today's question comes from Tracy who asks appropriately enough, why would somebody who wouldn't normally do so get involved in a riot? Well, that there are a lot of factors that lead to these types of behaviors. As we were talking about earlier, one of the factors that leads to some of this behavior is this feeling of certainty in these uncertain times. Now, it's not a, a particularly productive decision, but it does help maintain that, it helps counteract that feeling of uncertainty. Some other reasons why this occurs is one is uh, social proof. Uh, one of our second biggest fears for human beings is the fear of rejection. And that's not necessarily specific to a group. It's specific, it can be specific to a situation. So, if you are around a bunch of people who are doing something, you have a very big tendency to engage in that same behavior, whether it's dancing or whether it's lazing around or whether it's rioting, because we often have this overwhelming desire to do what is going on, basically doing as the Romans do, so that we will be accepted by the group. Because from our survival uh, instinct, it's better to have many doing the same thing rather than one. So there's a, that's what the social proof aspect of this is. Uh, secondary to that is a sense or lack of responsibility. So somebody, somebody who, a single person, is unlikely to go out and trash somebody's house. But if there are a lot of people trashing somebody's house, you can engage in that and have a non-sense of responsibility. Or rather, it's this, the responsibility is spread throughout the group. So there is no one single person that's responsible for the behavior. So it's easy for us to get involved with it because of these factors. Now, these aren't the only factors, of course. Some, uh, some factors are more basic. Uh, we're constrained by social rules all the time, and acting outside of those social rules can be exciting. So there is some level of excitement involved. Some people will be very encouraged to do these kind of things because of that destructive nature that all of us have. Uh, you know, it's sort of the idea of, you know, if you've ever built a sandcastle on the beach, you spent time building it, but the fun part comes when you stomp all over it or you watch the tide tear it down. So there's, there are also these factors involved. So somebody who normally wouldn't uh, can get very free in their destructive nature 
because of these factors. Now, and see, these aren't simple reasons. These aren't these aren't just easy things to 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 lock onto, and especially when we're looking at it from the outside perspective. Uh, but that is some of the factors why somebody who normally wouldn't does. And it may explain some of what we're seeing. Uh, I guarantee you that all the people out there did not go in order to riot. Uh, that a lot of them are going out to being peaceful protests. And then somebody starts a fire. You, basically, uh, not necessarily a physical one here. Uh, you have you have a lot of folks in a heightened state of emotion, even just doing the protesting, even if it's peaceful, there's a heightened sense of emotion. And because of that heightened sense of emotion that's going through all the people, there is a lack of executive function in the front parts of our brain. And then one person or two people start rioting or simply amp up the emotional response or the emotional reactions, and then everybody joins in. Various reasons why people do it. Uh, it may not seem very uh, logical and it's not, but this is some of the reasons why people will engage in those activities. So thank you, Tracy, for that question. And if you have your questions, you know, you might see people do something and you're wondering why they're doing it, or you may just have questions about human behavior in general, please let me know at mike at whatdrivesyou.net. Thank you very much. You guys have a great day, and I look forward to talking with you soon.